Uh, so we have Pavel Dolgirev from Harvard University, and the presentation is entitled Single Spin, Single Spin Qubit Magnetic Spectroscopy of Two-Dimensional Superconductivity. The Zoom is yours. All right, thank you very much for introduction. Today, I'll briefly talk about these two works that we recently accomplished uh, with uh, Professor Eugene Denver, who used to be professor at Harvard, now at PTH, and with Professor Lukin at Harvard, and also with Professor Norm Yao. Um, so let me first talk about motivation. Uh, there are many uh, fascinating new two-dimensional materials that uh, have promise of uh, being superconductors. However, many of them are hard to probe. And in particular, an example of it is TMD materials, which uh, there is simply hard to make contacts. Uh, if you would try to apply something like bulk probes, like heat capacity, then you'll likely be measuring uh, substrate properties rather than the superconductor itself. If you think about other probes, and the conventional one is uh, Meissner effect, uh, then you immediately encounter that if you're talking strictly about two-dimensional superconductor, like uh, very, very thin, then Meissner effect is not an option as well. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about STM, but uh, there are studies of this STM in both uh, TNGs and the uh, and, uh, uh, twisted graphene. Uh, but what is uh, happening is that uh, STM is super susceptible to disorder, so it's hard to uh, claim what is the parent symmetry. And you know, uh, this is our primary motivation to investigate uh, alternative probes, and we, uh, I will be talking about in the centers, uh, more generically, qubit centers, uh, as, as a, a non-invasive wireless probe of atomic electron superconductivity. This is also work about the method rather than uh, particular material. Like we want to understand how these detectors work. Okay, so let me. Uh, the setup is simple. Uh, we have a true two-dimensional sample. We have a spin impurity qubit here. What we imagine is that there is some kind of optical protocol that prepares initial state. So you imagine there is spin that points in, say, in upwards direction. Then in the, inside the sample, there are you know thermal fluctuations of electric current. These thermal fluctuations in turn create fluctuations of magnetic field at the position of the qubit. So I, I think about Hamiltonian as if there is, you know, intrinsic uh, splitting and the external magnetic field that in our case comes from, from the sample. If we think about low enough temperatures, this is the only source uh, for this uh, spin to, to eventually decohere. And the, this decoherence time is what we, what we say is one over T1 measurement, okay? Uh, when one thinks about uh, uh, 181 measurement, then there is a you know, very quick exercise to show that this uh, uh, relaxation rate will be given by magnetic noise tensor, which is nothing but a uh, you know, correlation function of, of this type shown here. Now, in turn, to understand and appreciate uh, what this, uh, what the content of this object is that now I can use the fluctuation dissipation theorem and relate this uh, magnetic noise tensor to uh, various uh, uh, reflection coefficients. So, and those various reflection coefficients are related to conductivities. This being said, by measuring one over T1, I in turn will be able to probe the transport properties of the sample, which is our goal because we want to detect uh, superconductivity. Uh, to understand uh, what is uh, actual setup, I will have to introduce uh, two types of electromagnetic waves. The first one is uh, called S polarized waves, and it means that electric field points, uh, you know, here uh, in out of plane direction, so that when I think about the sample, electric field will be orthogonal to the wave vector and it will create uh, uh, what I call transverse currents. The setup here implies that uh, when you say write down continuity equation, 
the divergence of this current is zero so that such uh, electromagnetic field does not create uh, charge fluctuation in the sample. Uh, and uh, this will be the primary source of uh, fluctuations that people usually talk about. Uh, in contrast, uh, you can envision situation like here, where say electric field points be like here. And uh, now divergence of electric field in this sample is no longer zero. So you create uh, charge fluctuations, but inside the sample, you have strong Coulomb forces. So those strong Coulomb forces are very, very much suppressing fluctuations and making them actually not relevant, at least in metals. All right, uh, so let me talk, uh, come back to, uh, to the NV probe. Now what I envision that I can prepare uh, my initial uh, polarization in various directions. For example, I can prepare it along the Z axis. This a little bit complicated formula, it just tells me that the noise that I will be probing if I make such a setup will know only about the reflection coefficient of less polarized waves. Uh, in contrast, if you prepare uh, your initial qubit, say, along x-axis, then you will get contributions from both, uh, you know, as polarized waves and p-polarized waves. So if I, if I think about qubit, what it allows me, it, uh, it allows me to do three things. The first one is that I can tune temperature, Obviously, the second one, which is less obvious that in practice one can vary distance. And the third, I can vary polarization of the qubit in turn separate what I call longitudinal noise from transverse. Transverse is related to S-polarized, longitudinal related to P-polarized. Uh, one, one additional point that I want to make here is that uh, you may see that there is integral uh, that, that is over all modes that contribute to the noise. Uh, but actually what happens is that uh, among the waves that contribute, the dominant contribution comes from so-called evanescent waves. And in turn, it means that uh, there is a, you know, exponential cutoff here, which sets momentum roughly to be one over Z naught. I'll come back to this point in a, in a minute. Now let's uh, think about actual superconductors and uh, what we want to separate uh, the right uh, conductivity, uh, conductance as a sum of normal fluid component plus superfluid. Uh, what is uh, quite uh, important is that like, like I can consider two limits, say limit of very weak superconductivity, then uh, I immediately get say that my noise will know about uh, sigma n, only about quasi-particle response. Uh, and uh, the same holds for very strong superconductivity. I get that uh, again, noise will be will know about sigma n. And this is a generic statement that uh, in reality, you pro this uh, you know, decoherence will, will be sensitive to, to actually quasi-particle response. Um, what I want to uh, now point out is that uh, without even doing calculations, if I could have guessed this form, I can already give you answers because I know that uh, normal conductivity in the superconductor case, like in S-wave superconductor, will be exponentially suppressed. And in reality, uh, dramatic suppression of noise uh, is a signature of uh, superconducting to normal metal transition. Uh, and, you know, if this, uh, if this was a D-wave superconductor, then there is still suppression, but maybe not that dramatic. It's a power law as a function of temperature. Uh, another really exciting point to me is that, as I, as I said uh, before, if you take normal metal, then you can completely ignore longitudinal fluctuations. However, because uh, superconductor opens a gap for quasi-particles, it actually suppresses transverse fluctuations and the uh, longitudinal can start to dominate. And in reality, at very low temperatures, the actual signal will be entirely dominate, dominated by longitudinal noise. Okay, 
uh, the actual problem of uh, superconductors, two D superconductors, is super complicated. He, you can think of it as interplay of four different length scales, uh, like mean free pass, two to the disorder, qubit distance denote, uh, thermal wavelength, and the uh, super coherence length. And uh, it's fairly hard to classify all the possible various regimes that you can probe with such a probe, uh, qubit probe. Uh, this is like a map of, uh, of what we deduced by carefully analyzing all the uh, all the various conductivities. And uh, let me kind of point out uh, to this uh, really important message that if you take uh, conventional probes, uh, such as transport, usually what you do, you send Q to zero first, but keep omega finite. Whereas when you think about NV centers, what happens is that you keep Q to be finite, but omega is in the gigahertz range which is effectively for any reasonable system is zero. And so qubit probe indeed provides you with a very, very different uh, possibilities compared to conventional probes. And because uh, of this uh, new feature of uh, NV centers in particular, uh, one may ask, uh, can I send omega to zero and study what are the possible transport regimes? And it, in fact, uh, this way we discovered that, for example, disordered S wave and disordered D wave are very different because at a, at a large Q, we see either scaling Q minus three or Q minus two. And both are in principle accessible to qubit centers, sensors. Now, very final and potentially most promising direction for qubit sensors is that, as I pointed out, uh, at very low temperatures, so these uh, centers, sensors are mostly sensible to uh, longitudinal noise, but longitudinal noise probes, uh, in particular, Josephson plasmas, which are charged excitations. As such, you can probe actually uh, dispersion, dispersion relation of surface Josephson plasmas. And this is an example of a calculation uh, which, which works out. There are some subtleties. I would be happy to answer questions if you are interested. Um, so the summary of my talk is that this is a non-invasive wireless probe to study atomic and thin superconductivity. Uh, it allows to study pairing symmetry and phase transitions. It provides access to non-local uh, quasi-static superconductance, uh, and it, it allows you to probe collective modes. So this is uh, uh, my collaborators who I was privileged to work with. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We would have time for perhaps one short question and also a short answer. Are there, is there a question? Victoria. Yeah, I can uh, ask a short question regarding, uh, can you, uh, quickly explain uh, what was it a superfluid uh, contribution what is what is it physically so quasi particle contribution and superfluid so can you explain what is superfluid one in in, in a superconductor yeah in yeah. sigma sigma and it was at the beginning there was two, two, yes superfluid what what is this uh, physically uh, and, uh, so i i think about this as a like in spirit of london's equation Right when we when we write down London's equation, we think about say omega equal to zero response, mm -hmm. and usually you don't even think about normal particles. Whereas uh, when you're interested in finite omega response, uh, there is a contribution from not only superfluid but also from quasi particles. And you okay. can see that there is omega division here. Mm -hmm. Actually, your current is always a sum of to whatever approximation you have in mind, that there is quasi particle contribution that is usually suppressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you.